bit overwhelming, really, um, to have you all here. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much to our special guests. I wanted to add one more special guest here today, Kathy Gutjagka, who's here, and she recently won the Australian Medal. She's the MT Senior Australian of the Year this year, and she's a leader in the work that she has done. <laughs> In Indigenous education for many years. She also isn't scared to take me, shake me by the scruff of the neck and get me to think a bit differently about the world, which is really important. So I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Larrakea people. I acknowledge the traditional owners that are here today uh, from many different places and elders here today. And I hope that the, you'll hear their voices, the many people I've worked with over the years and I, that I bring life to the work that we've done to try and think differently about Indigenous futures and the leadership that Northern Australia can show. Um, and it's also happy NAIDOC. Uh, it's wonderful that we've got, because of who we can, we've had a day just surrounded by fabulous women uh, showing what they can do. And it's been a real inspiration to be with them over the day. Okay. So I wanted to talk about the idea of advantage versus disadvantage. I think that we are often talking about Indigenous disadvantage. This is often the starting point for most of the work many people do in Northern Australia, for many of the discussions. And I'm not saying that's not real, and it's not important, and it doesn't need to be addressed. But I think what we have done is disguise that we have an absolute strength in Northern Australia, which is Indigenous advantage. The Indigenous estate, as Eddie Fry has talked about, is, and I'm referring to his talk at Gama Festival last year, where he talked about the assets that are held or might be held by or for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. They might be owned by a traditional owner, a native title or state or territory lands rights based organisation, Commonwealth or state and territory organisations, statutory bodies or funds that are established to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and that might include uh, the Indigenous uh, Land Corporation, the Land Account, the Aboriginal Benefits Fund, and other forms of structures that have developed. The Indigenous estate can be uh, tangible, things like land and water and the re resources that are located within, beneath or above them, but also the intangible, the cultural and intellectual property rights. That might be through art, through dance, through music, through language through traditional tr cultural, environmental and biosecurity practices and other forms of traditional knowledge. And already in preparing for this presentation, so many people have brought together ideas of there might be processes or ways of working that could be the leadership of the Indigenous estate. So why don't we put that at the front? Why do we think that there is an inherent potential to bring new perspectives, knowledge and innovation to the wider economy? And why don't we have that as part of our conversation? Over the last decade, we've had seen a lot of agreement making developing around the Indigenous estate, and that has been through asset swap, swapping or conversions of interest that allow uh, people access to the resources that are in the Indigenous estate, and that might have a limited period and that is liable to go up and down with the prices of commodities. So it, it is quite volatile and is starting to see a tailing off in many areas. And what we're seeing internationally is some of those places close down and leave people in a terrible position. And that's starting to be the future of Australia. Already we're seeing that with Jabiru. What do we do next if it, once the Jabiru mine has closed and everything leaves? There's also one-off tenure arrangements, arrangements being tested, like 99-year leases, where a small proportion of the best land might be offered so that people can have the ability to develop new approaches, develop new partnerships and develop new ways of working. So people are testing the limits of the Indigenous estate as we speak and working out what works, what could be, and how to utilise not only that economic um, asset, but also the human resources and structures that need to be developed to work around it. And this is what's really interested me, is thinking about, well, what could be? What if we decided that this is the future? That in, and I know Eddie Fry is saying 50 years, I'd like to bring it a whole lot closer. Let's say in 20 years, we're going to have the Indigenous estate is going to bring an Indigenous advantage to Northern Australia, where we'll be seen as the world leaders in understanding how to make things work in a different way. And what has shocked me was, I went to a, recently to a conference overseas, 
And everyone was looking to us to have those answers. They thought we were already doing it and we already knew the answers to different ways of working. So maybe there's a whole lot going on already in Northern Australia that we're too deep in to see. Maybe we're able to do this and there's a whole lot of processes that are happening that will take us forward if we could just imagine that future. And so I've been thinking about this for a while and uh, two things happened that really got me thinking. The first was a trip to Onslow. Onslow's in, it's a coastal town in the Pilbara, uh, has less than 500 people living there. They have two mines, a SAM mine and an LPG mine. They've managed to convert that opportunity of working with those mines to an incredibly different place. So working in their community, it's dead quiet all day because everyone's at work or everyone's at school. Uh, People, when we went in to do the project, and we're going to do an Aboriginal project around, you know, a project focused on Aboriginal people and sleep patterns, people said, no, no, we work together here. This will be an Onslow project because we think about things this way. We live together, we work together, we will do this project together. They were really quite confident in shaking up all the models of what a community is. And I realised that I had developed a really deficit model in my head of what a community was. And I've been really, I was really shaken out of that position. And working with senior people there, um, I was saying oh, to one woman, oh, well, you'll be able to retire. You've had all this su success. She said, retire? No, I'm not retiring. I've worked out how to not only employ people, but how to manage the difficult times, how to negotiate when a family member isn't doing the right thing at work, and I've got to sort that out. I've negotiated how to work with major companies where they now will come to me and they will offer every single person who ever comes into Onslow to work will be doing... Uh, cultural training and we'll be doing that training. I haven't got an embarrassment of having work, I've got embarrassment of too much work and trying to work out how we're going to turn this into a positive model. Her brother was doing the Ranger program and they'd flipped the model and they rejected government money because it's much easier to work with the companies because they can negotiate and stand there and work toe to toe because they're together all the time. And they had a really successful Ranger program. So I'm not saying Onslow's the answer, I'm not saying Onslow's perfect. But they have broken the model and for me it was a moment of, hang on, what, what really should we be aiming at and what should we be thinking our future is and why don't we treat that as a starting point and work back from there. And then the second thing that happened, I was recently at Heathrow going through the interminable um, processes for security and I ended up, you know, my stuff got sent to the wrong queue and it's off and it, yeah, anyway. anyway. So you end up standing there chatting to complete strangers. And um, he turned around and he was a logistics person and he said, if we had known this was what we were going to end up doing for security to get on a plane, wouldn't we have designed the whole process differently? The airport would be designed differently, baggage would be decided, designed differently, everything would be a completely different process. Well, hang on, why don't we do that right now? Why don't we start to think about what if we were going to design a future for Northern Australia that was powerful, that was built on Indigenous advantage, and we're going to get ready for that. How would we work differently? So this is what I've been thinking about for the, for the recent uh, past. The other thing I think that's really important in this is the idea of disruption. We are incrementally improving life expectancy, but this is so slow. And it's a similar uh, sort of trajectory along many different uh, areas of the demography or outcomes that we can map. It's so slow, it's, go it's not going to work in 20 years that we're going to close that gap. Because not only does change happen slowly, uh, you'll see that the top line for non-Indigenous people for the whole of Australia, that is actually increasing as well. So the gap is going to remain. It might close a bit, but it's going to take too long for us to close that gap unless we do something a bit different. So I don't think incrementalism is going to work. I think we need to think about disruption. And I think we're really good at that, actually, in the North, I'd say. That's our strength. Um, and disruption's really interesting because disruption is, I think, about managing discomfort. And that, for me, is largely what working in cross-cultural settings is. It's not about finding a point of absolute comfort. It's about saying, I'm uncomfortable. And when I find out some more, I'll probably still be uncomfortable or more uncomfortable. And that will continue the more I learn and the more I work things out as I find things are more complicated. There's a lot more going on than I knew. But I'm happy to live in a space with discomfort and to work through it. That's going to become the normal. So I think disruption is a really important concept for us as long as we... Because it gets us thinking about living with discomfort, living with 
a different way of working and focusing on innovation that will help us jump through and break a focus on incrementalism. And this was really brought home by some work that um, Pascal Tremblay and Alicia Boyle, they hosted a workshop talking about tourism. And the most wonderful woman came to speak, to speak to us and she was asked to speak on successful tourism businesses. And she said, no, I'm not going to do that. So she talked about disruption. She said, I'm going to talk about how to make a business fail because she had won every award, she was making money, she was employing people, everything was going as the trajectory would suggest a successful business would, would uh, go on. And then Uber came along and they went from winning all the NT business awards for tourism to being closed 12 months later. Because the system changed, there was a big disruption. They weren't ready for it, they hadn't planned for that and hadn't seen it coming. And it had completely changed their lives. So this disruption is part of our lives, it is ever present. We can either be, uh, we can be disrupted and <laughs> be hanging on and trying to cope or we can be active in the disrupting and using that idea. I think it's very interesting now to how much disruption's in our lives. We now go to chemists and hardware warehouses. We don't necessarily go to shops anymore. You think of all the different things, the Uber, the Airbnb, the new one that's coming, these experiences. All of those are built on a model that says we have no infrastructure and we're able to build new business models. And I see so many African groups saying, aha, <laughs> you know what we're really good at? It's working without much infrastructure or resources. We're really good at that. So we can take that model and leap forward with it. Um, they're not all going to work. You think about this new, the Melbourne I saw last night on the news, that the new bikes, putting bikes everywhere, they're going to close that because so many of the bikes have ended up in the Yarra and in trees and other artistic events. Um, so not all of that disruption is going to work and we're going to need to be a bit resilient to manage that change. So I've been looking for a model to think differently. And I was thinking that one of the things we do when we go to other countries is we think it's, oops, yep, we think it's completely normal to work in different ways. What if we applied some of that to working in Aboriginal Australia? So I've got, um, mm, I don't know if the clock thing's working. Anyway, we'll hope. So I had a look at uh, a, some guides for China, working in China. And these just resonated so much when you think about working in Aboriginal Australia. So let's have a go at looking at the guide for China and seeing how it might be relevant for us. Strategic positioning. Um, I'm going to use the work from Graham Orr from McKinsey & Co. Uh, they've got a pocket book to working in China, but it's pretty similar if you look at most of these guides that, that are out there. It's a very consistent message, but I'll use him, his for this uh, purpose. The first thing he says is work out why you are there. Are you there to, um, in, are you in China for the opportunity that is in China, or there is an opportunity to partner and have an, op have an opportunity elsewhere? Work out why you're actually there. Because most problems that happen in the, Chinese, in the Chinese relationships is because you're ready to commit, but you aren't able to set the processes up to make all of these things happen. So focus on what you're really there for and the processes you need to make that happen. And how often uh, do you see businesses in Aboriginal communities there to help, when actually really when you think about it, there's an element of that help which is about helping your own organisation or helping the work that you want to be doing as well. And there's, I don't think there's any problem with admitting that and actually saying, let's work on a partnership where we say, who are we here? Why are we here? What's the benefit we've got in this position? Now, if I can articulate that and you can articulate it, now we have a completely different way to start working. And why can't we be honest about that? And if it's about partnership for a um, opportunity elsewhere, maybe it's working into Southeast Asia, and it's beneficial to be working with Aboriginal people to do that in a joint venture process. Let's talk about it that way. I think we've got, um, got to get over talking about that we're going to fix problems and solve disadvantage. Why don't we talk about this as just an opportunity to be strategic? It's good for us, it's good for you. Now let's make the deal and see what that looks like. The next one is about... It's working, yep. Thinking about who and who you're with and who's going to be involved. So for many Chinese companies, they see people coming in as there as a temporary and short-term accelerator. They're not there to solve all the problems of, of, of the company, of a region or of the country. 
They're there to do a small thing. And therefore, you need to have deep and solid connections to make things happen. And if we think about that, that's because they have scale, but they now have capital, they have people they can hire, they have resources. Well, there's Aboriginal communities that they might not have scale, but a lot of Aboriginal communities, when they're starting to go into these deals with the Aboriginal estate, start to have that capital, they have the resources, and they have the people. So what if we were going into that with a different strategic position, and then you'd think about the partnerships. Getting the right people in the right place is really important. And all of the uh, recommendations say not going in saying, this is how we do it in our country, and this is how we're going to be doing it in China, as the Chinese will be t terribly uninterested in that. It's actually a huge turn off. People actually want to work in the ways in th that are considered valuable for their country and from their experience. Now, how, imagine if that's what the way we worked into, started in a partnership where we said, how could this operation work? What would work differently? And never saying, this is how we do it at our organisation, but completely starting from, let's negotiate a new way that's meaningful for this place and for this time. That means getting the right people in the right place. The first pe thing about the right people in the right place is having clear who in the senior hierarchy from your own company is going to be involved and to make sure they're committed. One of the things all the paperwork says about China is don't delegate. Don't say this is the, the right person and this is the person you'll be seeing and this is the person you have a partnership with and then you never see them again. Now, I can imagine that would ring true for a lot of Aboriginal communities to feel like that person that you did the deal with, that you have the partnership with, is the person you see consistently. So think carefully about the person from your organisation who's going to represent that partnership, who will be there at the senior meetings, who'll be there when it's an important matter, and they are committed and they won't be sending a delegate. It's also about thinking about who your senior colleague might be in country. So make sure, the recommendation is that you have a senior person in country in China who is going to be there for the long term. He's the person who will see trouble coming. They'll know when uh, there's a potential disaster. They can tell you when things are going wrong that might not be public. And that they're 100% trusted to help you with compliance and managing risk and organising the business. Now, give that person the most senior role you can and support them to work with the, the identified person from your own organisation. Now, that seems to me to be something that we could do very easily in Aboriginal organisations. And it might be that they'll say, well, that's the way they did it in China. We'd like to do it this way. And that might be in a different structure. But as a starting point to say we will make the most senior person, we'll make sure it's the right person or group of people and we will establish that for the long term, that commitment to have that person as the one we will negotiate with and the one we will listen to. Seems to be very important. Uh, the next one is talent, mm, sorry, talent acquisition. One of the things that really was very strong in the paperwork from China is just because people have got degrees, just because people have got the right qualifications and just because they've uh, they look like they'll be the right people, doesn't mean they will be. So when you're setting up in China, there will be a high level of turnover, and that's to be expected, and you'll need to manage that process carefully, particularly where there's family relationships. So invest time in your uh, talent acquisition and your talent pool, and it, building up the skills that are not only the qualifications, but all the other skills that go around it of what we mean by that work and how it works here. Now, that rings very true for working in Aboriginal communities. How do you find the people who've got the right skills, and that might be the skills outside the system as well as in, and how might you build that talent over time, and that that will have turnover, and that's part of the system, and we actually get ready for that. If you're building up t people in the community, they are taking on senior roles, and then are able to take over other senior roles and build other elements of the community, that's success. So let's plan for success and let's plan for turnover. And what I find interesting about all of these is when we talk about China, it's like, OK, fine, that's what we're going to have to do. We'll have to accept that. Why don't we think like that when we're talking about Aboriginal communities? Intellectual property. Now, the issues around intellectual property are a bit different about how much intellectual property you'd need to work with in China and how much you'd take in and how much you wouldn't. But I think the thing that's really consistent in here is thinking about intellectual property. 
is the line that a Chinese partner will recognise the value of IP and be willing to protect IP developed jointly with them. So maybe there's a different way we can think about how we identify the IP that's involved in joint venture projects with Aboriginal communities. Identifying what is owned and what is uh, kept by each partner, but then what is the IP that's being developed together? And if we identify that, can we develop the processes that make that IP stronger and everyone ready to protect it no matter what? That's not something I hear about a lot, and I think that could really make a huge difference about differentiating the, differentiating the ways we think about IP. The economy. China is likely to be a more volatile economy, is one of the quotes that I found, and that you need to take a through cycle viewpoint rather than a quarterly performance versus, versus plan mindset. So basically that you anticipate there will be downturns, you anticipate that there will be problems. There'll be times when commodity prices are down, when there will be time when the business model is down. I think too often when we've built businesses for Aboriginal communities, there's been an expectation that there's only one way that business will go and only one way the economy will go. But if we set up processes that think about the downtimes and plan for them and allow steps backwards and forwards over time, that there is a long-term plan that, that has that adjustment built in, they'll be much more successful. And that means a long-term plan. And that means, I think, managing the short-term funding cycles that we often face so that we have a long-term plan no matter what's happening with the different funding cycles. One of the things we said, said with the Northern Institute is that we'll partner for the long term. Obviously, when there's funding there, we can do a lot more. We can be a lot more active. But we're not going to leave you behind and we won't not answer the phone and we won't still work together when there's no funding. It'll just change the way we do it. And because we articulated that, we've managed the ups and downs of funding cycles really well, I think, and maintained and grown those partnerships. So I think building that long-term plan with all of these partnerships in mind and then segmenting back is going to be a much more powerful tool. And it seems that that's what they're recommending here. Finally, don't do anything to compromise your global brand and your reputation. If you can't do business the way you want to, don't do it there. Don't do it at all, is what they're recommending. So making the decision that this might not be the place for you to be working, I think is a really hard one. But I think we need to get better at it. If this is not where your organisation or your agency is ready to partner and you're not the right people to be in this place, maybe we should be better at talking about that and deciding what is going to work with the brand, what is going to work with your reputation so that we don't end up in situations where everybody's unhappy and everyone's uncomfortable. I think that's a lot harder when you're in government because government needs to work with everybody and I think they're in the most difficult situation. But for many organisations who are planning projects, who are planning new ways of working, thinking about and being very careful and targeted with your partnerships is going to be very important. We also see this with regionalism. Uh, one of the major pieces of advice we get about working in international partnerships is not to treat a country as a homogenous group, not to think that you're working in China. You're not, you're working in one region. So if we change our approach to thinking about who we're really working with, if we decide where the brand opportunity lies, if we can partner that first and be very clear about where the joint opportunities and um, strengths are for the brand and reputation, we can be a lot more focused in the ways we're working. And I think that will really help make good decisions and avoid getting into partnerships that we're never going to work from the first place. So what does this look like? So I've had a go at starting what I think might be some of the key elements from a new way of working. I think it all starts from the Indigenous estate and having a good understanding of that estate. That's going to develop over time and we'll probably identify more and more elements of the Indigenous estate as we start to work there. But this is a conversation I think we need to have and get a much better at. It doesn't mean we need to know all the answers, but we need to start identifying elements of the Indigenous estate and how they relate to all of the business that happens in Northern Australia. Secondly, I think governance is absolutely essential. In every piece of research we've done partnering with Aboriginal communities in economic development, governance has been the make or break of those projects. If you do not spend time on governance, we get projects that never get off the ground or hit problems that if you'd look back, were obvious they were going to happen. 
And I think that's not only governance on the ground and governance of Aboriginal communities. If we're planning for a new future, if we think that Indigenous advantage is possible in 20 years' time, we can look to all the boards, to all of the governance structures of our organisations and say, if we thought that was going to be a success and this was going to be the future, who needs to be on our boards now? How do we need to change our governance structures right now to have a completely different way of thinking about our future and to make sure that there's the right Indigenous voices throughout the organisation and at the, the key uh, decision-making table at all times? How do we change that work? Or is it about having partnerships, which means you have different sort of joint venture arrangements and that's where the representation is? But I think it's a serious piece of work that needs to be done, not only in Northern Australia, but obviously Australia is challenged with that at the moment uh, and thinking about what that means for our parliament. But we could really lead in this way of working uh, as we have been working with people for such a long time, back and forth, everyone has been working together. There is no reason why we couldn't take this very seriously right now. Being place-based, I think we need to think about focusing very much on where your region is and knowing that region. Rather than thinking you're going to work across the whole of the Territory or the whole of Northern Australia and be an expert and have all the relationships and it'll all work. One of the things I saw that a group did is they actually said for their staff, for each region they worked in, they got two people who were the case managers for that region. That didn't mean they did all the work in that region. That didn't mean they knew everything about that region. But if you wanted to know who was who or what was happening, or if people from that community wanted to find out what was going on or tell someone, they knew who to call. They knew who the key people were. So having that key partnership, that identifying the right person and having them work together regularly and over a long term, actually changes the model completely about focus and understanding why you're there and what the opportunity is. I think it changes the conversation completely. It then brings up the issues of language. And too often, I think the, the depth and the breadth of languages, you know, we have such richness in language in Northern Australia, is seen as the problem. So if we were going to work to a place-based approach, language then becomes a strength because it's learning language together through doing work. And Stephen Bird's been challenging me on this lately. He's been terrific. Um, that do we need actually to teach English and teach specific languages? Yes. But what we need to do is teach language so we can do the work, so we can partner and we can think about things together and have the complex conversations. Um, that doesn't mean that you are perfect in each language, but you're able to get beyond the point where you are always having a, a discussion with low-level language. In China, we don't think twice about taking a translator to every single meeting. It's just a normal investment, it's part of doing business. Why isn't that part of the way we work here until we build those language skills and we improve that? I think a place-based approach would really help. Uh, corporate representation. Having a really clear picture about your business and what the partnership with Aboriginal communities is about means that you will change the way that you think about that organisation and how you represent it. And that will start to become consistent. And what I find interesting is in places that are doing this, and I saw this at Massey University, they're trying to think about who they are as an organisation. They could all say we are a treaty-led organisation. We don't know quite what that means, but we're working on it and we're all working on it. And everybody you met started talking about this being a very important part of their thinking. So I think if we start to change the ways we understand our role as organisations part in partnership, we'll start to change the way we represent ourselves and why we're there. And that could start to be from a very positive Indigenous advantage language. Imagine if that's the way we were presenting ourselves. In the North, consistently, you saw that people were partnering with strength in communities, not to go and fix problems. That would be a, just a game changer for the way we would understand our work and the way people would go to work and function in their roles. What's permissible? What's OK? Where can we invest? How do we make good decisions? I think that could be an absolute game changer for us that would be very important. And I'd love to see us leading in that space. We need to understand our competitive advantage. Why is it important that we do partner with Aboriginal communities or organisations or people? What is it that we're actually in there for? I think that's the, 
the core of it for me for changing the conversation and not be seeing, it, seeing organisations as going in there and saving people or fixing problems. We need organisations that do that and that's important that there are people addressing those challenges. But by being able to articulate a different sort of competitive advantage, why isn't it okay to say, we're here because, I, so I'm working on a partnership at the moment, and I'm, in, I'm saying, I know what the university is meant to be doing. We're meant to make sure there are strong accredited programs that meet the national audits and have this sort of content for people to be able to go and do this sort of work. And we're brokering a partnership with an Aboriginal community at the moment for a dual academy program. And they're very clear about what their job is in the process. And where we hit a bit of a problem was we realised that we'd started to share too much of who was meant to do what and who had responsibility. I don't have responsibility for what happens on country. I shouldn't have responsibility for who's representing that cultural knowledge. I shouldn't have responsibility for who's going to enact that work. That's the wrong way round. It's my job to make sure we're meeting the audit and that I respect the right person to make the decisions in that partnership. It has completely changed the language of the program and we had to ditch every bit of paperwork we'd done and start again from a position of both groups working from strength. And I would love to see the position that that's our future. I really believe we could be leaders in knowing how it looks when two organisations come together, both from a position of strength, both knowing what they want from that partnership, both knowing what they can ask from the other. So this is our need. We want you to come and help us with this. But we know about this stuff and we're strong here. And that that is the starting, part for, starting point for new joint ventures and for an economic future for Northern Australia. Um, I think this then changes the way we think about education. Education is often treated as hurdles or as... Um, <coughs> Offering the education that doesn't actually help you break into a new way of working. We've seen this a lot in adult literacy education. Adult liter literacy education that's divorced from context, that's divorced from the work, doesn't have a high level of success. When people have got opportunities to learn the literacy of the work they are doing, so work integrated learning, it, the difference is marked and is much more powerful, but it means it's much more concentrated and focused on particular areas of literacy. So I think we need to change the ways we're thinking about education. It's not only it might be a qualification, it might be that we need to know how to do this for this, for this um, context, for this time and for this experience. But it also might be the education of knowing how to do things. And that might be we have to learn that together. That's part of the work of the joint venture is a to and fro about learning how you do that work. And we might find that that's one of the Indigenous advantages, is really knowing having thousands of years in working together and working across systems. That might be an absolute strength. So I think we need to think about targeted, but changing the focus of the way we might identify what's involved in education and where we will invest. So from our experience in thinking about this a bit differently, some of the things that we're trying that I think have uh, built into this, this same model. The first one is to build and test decision making models. We don't know the answers to what the best way to make joint venture or partnership projects or what a new economic future would look like. And I think we need the chance to test a few out and try them. So building models, and we've seen a lot of communities do this, where they've actually built models, they try them out, and they've got a sunset clause. So after two, three, or five years, you can change it if it's not working. And what I hear is that people have a lot of confidence in that because they've got an opportunity to have a voice and they know when that will be. So they have changed the way they've worked over time and found that it has improved. It's also meant that as the business changes or... The, um, the disruption, external disruption changes, you're able to respond and you're not caught up in old arrangements. So this has been very powerful. To have agreed reporting and evaluation schema and that they need to be negotiated in partnership. How do we know if this is actually working? How would I describe what works? How would my partner describe what works? And how do we go to collect that information in a way that's sensible and fits in well with the business and that we'll both trust and that we can use to report uh, and, and gain success and, and support externally. 
And I think that takes time and it needs review. And I, what we've really seen is that that can't all be done at the beginning because you don't know everything at the beginning. You're always trying out something new so that you actually need to have review cycles for your evaluation to be able to build that over time so it understands how this works in this place, in this time, and we've got the right schema to understand that and to tell the story to other people. I always remember the staff coming out from um, Peter Garrett's office and looking at the Working on Country program. And they said, we think this is great. We think it's the answer. We really want to support, wa support working on country and see it go for a long time. We have no way to tell that story. And it left the whole program so, so vulnerable. So thinking very deeply about evaluation, I think, is really important. Anticipating change. We know that change will happen. We don't know what it'll look like. All we can guarantee is it's going to, it's going to be disruptive and it's going to open new opportunities and close things quite rapidly, and you might not see it coming. I think the example from the tourism sector that I spoke about before is such a good example of change coming like a thunderclap and changing, the, changing people's lives completely. So building in a model that says we know change will come, we don't know what it'll look like, but we are constantly talking and preparing ourselves so that we, when change starts to come, we're ready for it and we know how to work together. And that's about trust. I think that idea of getting the right people working together in the long term is the key to developing that anticipation of change because you're more likely to work out those sorts of problems with someone that you trust and you feel is on your side and is working with you. So developing that deep trust in everything that we do in the partnership means we will anticipate and we will cope with change. Um, one of the things that they used to say when I used to work in the Kimberley is the best thing that could happen to a new staff member that came out into the into work at the TAFE was that they could get stranded with the cultural liaison officer with a car breaking down. Now, we never set it up for a car to break down, but they often would come back because they had to solve a problem, they had to trust each other, they were stuck in a difficult situation they hadn't anticipated and they had to work through it together. They found that that was one of the most revealing moments for two people to start to work together and see themselves as a team, not as trying to do something that's really hard and outside of my comfort zone. But now I'm working with someone that I want to talk to and I know that they'll stand by beside me because they stood in the dust and they helped out when it was a bad time. So that anticipation of change is deeply embedded in trust. And that overarching those regular decision making, that regular evaluation, those regular processes that manage change is a long-term commitment that you're able to articulate. Skinny Fish, when they started, said, we will stand beside you for five years. Come good or bad, we'll be there for five years and we'll see how it goes. And they did. And you can see the success that the musicians have, who have worked with them have had. But it's because they were prepared to make a long-term commitment, not knowing what was going to happen and which things were going to work and which things weren't. And I think that's a really key part of why they've been able to develop projects that are very sophisticated and think about partnership in a very deep way. Finally, for me, and I have no evidence to back this up, but I think it is about a treaty-led future. I think we've led with the talk about a Northern Territory Treaty. I think that's something we should be building on. We should grab that with both hands and think about it. Um, I, I worry that a lot of the reconciliation plans ended up in the Indigenous part of an organisation with the responsibility going actually to the, to the wrong people in the organisation. A treaty could change the way we work. I don't know what that treaty would look like. I don't know how place-based they're going to be. I don't know any of those things. But I think we should get really seriously involved in the conversation of treaty. And the key reason for that is the work that I saw in New Zealand. And we were at a biosecurity conference. And every presenter who got up, and this had happened over a couple of conferences I've seen, um, there were people from the floor would get up and say, uh, Maori people would say, you know, we're from that place you've just done that presentation from. We know about that thing that you've just talked about and you never came and spoke to us. Why didn't you come speak to us? And at the last conference I was at, at the end, it was a fabulous woman, she was just indefatigable, in getting up at every time and saying, you could have spoken to us, we know about that, we could have helped you. And the last one, uh, the people got up and spoke and she said, you know, Thank you very much. You came and spoke to us and we did this project together. And consequently, it had been a very successful and powerful project that was going to be used elsewhere. 
But what she articulated for me about treaty, she said that treaty is a two-way process. Because we have treaty, not only do you have to come and talk to me, but I have to come and talk to you. And I have to help you understand how you could have done this better. This is a two-way process. We could really lead the thinking about two-way processes that will change our world and change the future of the Northern Territory. Now, why do I believe this is true? Because we're actually doing it. So I've been writing this, this talk for a while and I keep going to meetings and people describe the processes they're going through and the Northern Territory is doing this in so many different places. We have pockets of excellence in dealing with all of these issues and people are, have spent the time and are willing to work in new ways and are working out what that means. It may not be structural yet. It may not be endemic, but we are leading and we are really powerful in this place. I think it's really time to take control and show off a bit and feel a bit more confident about what we're doing and make that what we, how we talk about ourselves, that we are ready for a future of Indigenous advantage, will lead, will be a partner, and our organisation, wherever you're from, is ready to think about those key issues. And it, you know, we've done that through Yucky. We've had uh, the Yolngu Action Consultants Initiative, which started as a way to employ Aboriginal people to be involved in research. And Gutha is one of the people that was involved in that uh, initiative who now lead the way we think, who've completely changed the, the way that we do research, the sort of research we do. Um, Gutha, for example, leads an ARC project, an Australian Research Council project with Linda Ford. She has changed the way research is happening here at Charles Darwin University, and many others have done that as well. So we know it can happen. And I was in a fabulous meeting yesterday. I was really pleased to see this one. This is... Um, uh, from the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. And they would, it was a handover meeting for the new boss that's coming in. And he said, do you remember that t three years ago, I challenged him when he came, he started in the Northern Territory, and he said, uh, we're gonna go out and do all this work in remote communities and we're going to fix things. And you can imagine what I said. So I challenged him to think about who should be doing that work, where they should be investing, how that work could be done in a different way. And he's just leaving the role right now and handing over to an Aboriginal man to take over the position. And he wanted to share the report because what he said is now every job that we used to do from the state agency and that we were planning to invest in is done by an Aboriginal person. They've now got biosecurity rangers doing that work across Northern Australia. Those people have got together and built the resources about how to do biosecurity. And he said, we don't argue anymore about is the logo two and a half centimetres or two and three quarters centimetres from the edge of the page. They're arguing about how do we adapt that for our place and our place and our place and our place. Because people own those resources and want them to happen. And they're already starting to think about the next stage. And I'm not allowed to tell you, which is just crushing me, but they've got the next challenge and they've already got... Um, resources have been committed for that and they'll be announcing that very soon. So they've actually changed the way that they work and they function as a whole organisation. And what they said they had to do was listen, go out on a limb, but knowing that there's a whole lot of people hanging on to you while you're out on that limb because they told you to get out there. But to know what you could do as an organisation to make change happen, to be very, very clear about what your role in that change was, be able to articulate it, make mistakes, get up, keep going, keep going, keep going. And they've done that really effectively and they have changed the way that that work is done across Northern Australia. It's all new, it's amazing. And I'm really, really pleased to be able to see that it's really happening, it's, it's not a dream. Uh, we just need to start to spread that news. So I think it's time for change. I think it's, I put out that challenge for everyone to decide what your role is in working in a new way to understand your own and your organisation's value proposition and to plan a new future in partnership that will put us on the world stage and tell the new story about Indigenous advantage. Thank you. <laughs>